Hello everyone, thanks for joining us for this webinar on the topic of choosing the right microscope for live blood analysis. I am your presenter Elizabeth Clemens from Live Blood Online where we offer uh, online training courses for live and dry blood analysis. We teach practitioners from all over the world and if you'd like to know more please see our website www.livebloodonline.com and uh, we get many questions regarding choosing the right microscope so Dr. Ocker our course tutor and microscope experts, expert is here to explain the importance of knowing exactly what is needed for live and dry blood analysis and also to help you avoid making any expensive mistakes. So we'll be answering your questions throughout as well as at the end so please locate the questions box in your go to webinar panel and type your questions in there. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Ocker now. Thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Ocker. Um, why is it important to view this webinar before buying a microscope? All right. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, and, and welcome, everyone. Well, um, you know, for, for many practitioners, Elizabeth, using a, a microscope is a, a completely new experience. Uh, as practitioners, we are usually trained in nutrition and, and herbal medicine and other natural modalities that help us to, to uh, help our clients. But we're not normally trained in microscopy. And when you start researching uh, microscopes, you actually find uh, that this is a very complex field with its own terminology or, or language, if you like, um, just like any other discipline. Now, normally when we need to invest in a piece of equipment, we rely on the expertise of the people who work in the field to make the best decision. Now, the challenge is, however, that many microscope suppliers simply do not know what is required of a microscope system to perform a live blood analysis properly. Yes, that's quite surprising, isn't it? When you look at all the different microscope systems that are available, many of them claiming to be dark field microscopes. Some of these systems are very cheap as well. Uh, we often have attendees ask us if these would be suitable for live blood analysis. Why are these cheaper microscopes not suitable? Well, that's a very good question, and it's one of the questions that we'd like to address uh, specifically in this webinar. Now, I'm sure that you'll agree that it's very important to have a suitable microscope uh, system because if you if you don't, you simply won't be able to see what you should be able to see in the blood. Uh, the risk is that with a cheaper system, uh, you may end up with a dark field image that looks like this example that we've that we're going to show you now. All right. So this is the type of image that you're likely to get with a. a cheaper type of microscope system, um, some of these ones that are available online for a couple of hundred dollars and um, you know they claim to be able to do dark field but this is usually the type of image that you'll get in live blood. Um, now typically the specifications are a 20 watt light source which is really critical with a, a blood analysis microscope scope. Um, the type of light source is often really crucial to what you're going to see under the microscope. Um, and this is using a 40 times objective um, and also with a dry dark field condenser um, and the standard type of on-screen magnification that you would get with most uh, laboratory microscopes. Now if you compare that to what you're actually supposed to see um, in the same live blood sample with the, the right type of microscope system you can see it's a huge difference. Yeah, you can definitely see a huge difference between the images. So what are the main differences between the systems then? Right, well, as I mentioned, the, the first uh, system uses a 20 watt uh, light source. It is a 20 watt standard laboratory microscope. Um, now, the system would have all the standard specifications for routine laboratory use uh, with none of the uh, specifications uh, specific type of, of um, features needed for um, proper live blood analysis. Um, so it has a 20 watt halogen light source, a dry dark field condenser and the, the standard on-screen type of magnification with these microscopes. Now the second image on the other hand is from the HD LED microscope. Um, now the one important difference with this microscope is the light source. There's a 9 watt 
LED light source, which is equivalent to about a hundred watts uh, halogen. So it's much, much brighter. And then we use an oil immersion dark field condenser. Um, and then also the third point is there's increased on-screen magnification. You can actually see that very clearly by looking at the two images, um, the size of the cells much bigger on the on the example on the right hand side. So we have a total magnification on screen using the 40 times objective, the same objective used in the example on the left hand side, um, but this uh, magnification we achieve on screen is 1,600 times versus uh, the um, versus the 400 times magnification that we get with the standard system on the left. Um, now we'll go into detail in each of these features um, to show you how they actually affect what you're able to see in the blood. Uh, the most important factor that sets these microscopes apart and determines the price is actually how well they, they manage with dark field. Um, now there are a very strict set of requirements for dark field analysis of, of live blood specifically. Uh, many of these microscopes do have dark field capabilities um, and they do claim to to uh, be able to to um, you know that you should be able to use them for dark field, but when it actually comes to analysing live blood, um, they're not really suitable. Uh, so I don't believe that it's really a case of the microscope supply, suppliers intentionally uh, trying to deceive people, you know, claiming to sell these dark field microscopes that are not really suitable for dark field. It's simply that they don't know what is required for viewing live blood. Uh, properly in dark field. I see, thank you. Um, so our course is not exclusively based on dark field analysis. We have many live blood anomalies that have examples in both bright field and dark field. And dry blood analysis is of course only done in bright field. So how important a role does dark field really play in live and dry blood analysis? Well, dark field analysis uh, or, or being able to analyze blood properly in dark field really does play a critical role, role in live blood analysis. Um, now, there are some anomalies that can only be seen in bright field and some that can only be seen in dark field. Uh, and this is why we always look at a blood sample first in, in bright field before going over to dark field. Um, however, I usually would spend around 10 minutes um, in bright field because there are, uh, there's just so much more that we can see in dark field. So the balance of the analysis is all done in dark field. Uh, and often the anomalies that we see in dark field are fundamental to the case and they, they actually determine the direction then taken in terms of treatment of a case. So if you're not able to view blood properly in dark field, you would then potentially miss all those other anomaly, anomalies and the treatment that you decide on then in the case may not really be the best and most appropriate for your client. I see. Um, and this would also affect your experience as a practitioner with live blood analysis, wouldn't it? Because you may not see the results you expect to see in practice. Well, that's absolutely true. Um, you know, this is a, a very important potential pitfall to watch out for when incorporating live blood analysis into your practice. It's, it's really critical that you have the correct system right from the start. Um, you know, no, nobody really wants poor results, not the, not the practitioner and certainly not the, not the client. Um, now, I was very fortunate when I started analyzing blood that I was able to start uh, from the very beginning with a very good quality microscope, very similar to the standard 50 watt halogen units that we have now. Uh, and over the years, I've, I've seen consistent great results with live blood analysis in my practice. Uh, and I have no doubt of its ability to, to highlight the most important uh, issues in a case. Now, the two main reasons why some practitioners don't see the results um, that they expect to see with, with live blood analysis is firstly their level of training. Um, you know, if they're not familiar with all the possible anomalies uh, and what they mean, uh, then they won't be able to use live blood analysis properly. And secondly, if their microscope system isn't suitable for live blood analysis, then it really doesn't matter if they if they are familiar with all the anomalies. You know, if they're not able to see them, it it still doesn't really help. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so in the invitation for this webinar, we mentioned that not all microscopes are created equally. And as we mentioned earlier, some microscope systems are very cheap, whilst the microscopes used for live blood analysis tend to be more costly. So what are the reasons for the higher price tag on live blood analysis microscopes? Well, one of the factors uh, would be supply and demand. You know, microscopes that are, are mass produced, um, your standard laboratory microscopes are usually much cheaper. Um, now these tend to have all the same standard specifications that all normal laboratory microscopes have. Uh, and none of them are actually suitable for live blood analysis. Uh, and when a microscope, where a microscope system has been manufactured, uh, also plays a role. Uh, generally, microscopes produced in, in China are much cheaper. Um, most of the microscopes that are available online are actually from China, even those sold on some of the websites in the USA. Uh, the main problem with these Chinese microscopes is not that all of them are of an inferior quality. Uh, some of them are actually quite good, but many of them are not good at all, and it's it's really not always possible to tell them apart, you know, when, when shopping online. Um, and that really is the main problem. Uh, so here it comes down to the, the components that are used within the microscope. Now I've seen microscopes where the actual gears uh, in the focusing mechanism in the microscope were actually made of cast iron. Um, now usually these components are, are, are made of harder wearing materials such as brass because you know of the constant wear on these parts. Uh, cast iron gears are of course much cheaper to manufacture uh, but they're really not going to last long at all. Wow, that's a bit shocking. Um, reliability is obviously very important because you're going to be using your microscope every day on each and every client and the last thing you need is for it to suddenly stop working, yeah? Absolutely, yes, and because it's such a specialized tool, it's unlikely that you'll have another one lying around that you could then use. Definitely. Um, so build quality and the quality of the internal components are some of the factors. What are the other factors that determine the cost of a microscope? Well, other than the build quality, there are a few, quite a few other factors. Um, now, I'll discuss them and I'll have to get a little bit more technical uh, and resort to using some of the terminology used in, microscop in microscopy here, but I'll explain everything as we go along. Um, so firstly, let's uh, talk about the objectives. Now, on a microscope, the objectives are the lenses that are usually found just above the stage that provide the uh, different and determine also the different levels of magnification. Now the basic entry level type of objective um, are called uh, achromatic. Now this means that only the central 60% uh, or so of the image will be focused and color corrected. The remaining 40% around the edges will actually appear blurry. The, uh, in the slightly more expensive semi-plan objectives, the central 80% of the, of the image will be focused, um, and the most expensive objectives are called plan achromatic, um, and they produce an image that is 100% flat, in focus, and color corrected. Uh, so what they mean with, with color corrected objectives is that all the colors of the spectrum will be visible in the viewing field. Uh, so in the cheapest objectives, the, the achromatic objectives, only the central 60% of the field of view uh, will be color corrected. Now this means that the color of objects around that area would actually not be correct. The other important issue then also with regards to objectives is the numerical aperture. Uh, now this simply determines how much light an objective will allow through. Uh, it's, 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 uh, this is actually quite standard for most objectives and when it comes to dark field um, we actually need a, a much lower aperture than the standard one used for a, a large hundred times objective. Now if you use a, a standard hundred times oil emergent objective uh, for dark field you would not really be able to see much at all unless you're able to adjust the aperture. Uh, so to reduce the amount of light allowed through. Uh, the most expensive 100 times objectives come with a, a built-in iris diaphragm that then allows you to adjust the aperture. 
without this feature, the 100 times objective is actually of very little use in live blood analysis. Uh, as I mentioned, the 100 times objectives that have this feature, this um, built-in RS diaphragm, uh, are actually very expensive. They normally sell for around $300 or so. Uh, and that's really just for the objective, which is, you know, more than what some of these cheaper microscopes go for. Um, now, we actually have an example of a live blood sample in dark field uh, using a normal plan achromatic 100 times oil immersion objective. Uh, this is the cheaper one without the built-in iris diaphragm. And you can see there's actually very little that you can tell from this image. You, you can see that there might be some, some cells in this field of view, but there's very little that you can actually see from this. Um, compared to to the image that we would get with a 100 times objective with a built-in iris diaphragm. Uh, that is really more what we would expect to see. Uh, you can clearly see the difference. The, the um, objective without the iris diaphragm just allows through too much light. Uh, so there's just far too much reflected light in the sample, which then makes it basically impossible to see anything at all. So the amount of light that the objectives allow through plays an important role then, especially in this 100 times objective. The type of dark field condenser you use also affects how much light is allowed through into the sample, isn't it? Absolutely, yes, that's that's a very important point. Um, you know, when it comes to the type of dark field condenser, uh, the oil immersion type is the only one that you really should use for live blood analysis. Um, now, the reason for that is, again, related to the amount of light allowed through into the sample, which then determines what you'll ultimately be able to see in the sample. Um, so there are two types of dark field condensers. There's the type that, that uses oil, an oil immersion dark field condenser, which is the type we recommend. And then there's this, this type, which is the dry dark field condenser. And this is an example of an image of live blood in dark field using this dry dark field condenser. And this is with a fairly good quality microscope. This is a, a 9 watt LED microscope. Um, so there's enough brightness coming from the light source. Um, but because the dry dark field condenser allows through too much light, uh, we don't really get that type of, of um, of definition that we expect to see normally in a, in a proper dark field image. So if we compare that to the um, dark field image using an oil immersion condenser, so that is actually what we should be able to see. Um, so as you can see with the dry dark field condenser, you're not really able to see much detail between the cells and inside the cells. Um, and this is the same blood sample that we've used here. So you can clearly see that the dry condenser, we can't really see any target cells or any chylomicrons. Um, whereas the, with the oil immersion condenser, the target cells and the chylomicrons are actually very clearly visible. Now, if there was anything less uh, reflective than these chylomicrons, uh, like for example, fibrin or signs of fermentation or any of the pleomorphic growth forms, uh, you, would have not, you would not have seen that with the uh, dry condenser. Yeah, that's quite clear. Um, both of these images were taken with the same microscope, the only difference being the type of dark field condenser used. Is that right? Correct, yes. So the brightness of the lamp or light source plays an important role as well then, does it? Absolutely, it does. It, it is actually one of the most important factors that determines whether a system will be suitable for live blood analysis. And this is usually the first thing to check when looking at a, a, a microscope to see whether it will work for live blood analysis. Now, most of your normal microscopes, and this is easily 95% or more of, of microscopes that are available out there have a 20 watt uh, lamp. Um, now this is not nearly not uh, bright enough for dark field analysis. Uh, some so-called dark field microscopes have a 30 watt uh, lamp 
um, or three watt halogen lamp, but even this is still not bright enough. Um, to be able to see the structures that you really want to see in dark field, uh, you will need at least a 50 watt halogen lamp. Um, now this will produce enough brightness to illuminate the small and fine structures between the cells. Uh, anything less than 50 watt will not produce enough brightness and you'll uh, essentially just see what you saw in bright field but against a, a dark background. Okay, so <clears throat> the standard 50 watt system that we recommend is a 50 watt halogen system but the most popular system is actually the LED system. So what level of brightness does the LED system produce then? Well, the LED system has a 9-watt LED lamp. Um, now, this is equivalent to almost a 100-watt halogen. Um, so it's it's even brighter, you know, provides twice the amount of brightness than the 50-watt uh, halogen system. Now, there are some LED microscopes available out there, but again, you know, looking at them, 99% or so of them will have a 3-watt LED lamp, uh, which is again not nearly bright enough for dark field. Um, now the 9 watt LED is, is actually quite unique to our systems. You won't really find that in any other microscope system uh, with LED. Um, I've, not, I've not come across any other systems with the same strength of LED light source. Um, the only equivalent that you would be able to find then would be a 100 watt uh, fiber optic uh, cold light source. So, you know, first, just to illustrate here the differences in what you'll see in dark field based on the strength of your light source alone, uh, we have a few examples here. So, this is a, uh, an image here of live blood with a standard 20 watt halogen microscope using a dry dark field condenser. And there's a, the increased on screen magnification there, so we're looking at 1,600 times magnification. Now, if we compare that to ne the next image um, where a, an oil immersion condenser was used, um, but this is also with a 20 watt light source, um, you can see that the, the, the dry condenser does allow through more light, so the image is slightly brighter than, than this image, um, but we're still nowhere near to what we should be seeing in dark field, um, which is which is the next image. So compared on there, you can actually see the image on the left-hand side is the dry dark field condenser, which is uh, allows through more light, but it doesn't doesn't allow you to see all the detail that you should be able to see in dark field, which is in the next image that we're going to look at now. So this is with the LED microscope with a nine watt LED, uh, equivalent to about 100, about 100 watt halogen, uh, with a 40 watt objective and the oil immersion dark field uh, condenser. Very interesting. The magnification range is also quite important, isn't it? Live blood analysis requires a different setup with regards to the magnification to the camera as well. Could you explain what is required here, please? Well, absolutely, yes. This is, uh, again, a, a very important feature and one that will also play a, a very big role in one's ability to observe all the anomalies in the blood properly. Um, now normal microscope systems are set up in, in such a way that the magnification that you get on the screen, um, so the, the magnification through the camera tube to the camera, is the same as the magnification that you have through the eyepieces. Um, now in most situations this makes sense, um, but in live blood analysis we actually need a magnification of at least a thousand times on the screen when we're analyzing a live blood sample. Anything below that won't allow you to see enough detail in the cells properly to be able to distinguish between, um, you know, the diff different type of anomalies. So if you have a standard microscope setup to achieve a, a thousand times magnification on the screen, you would need to use a, a hundred times objective. Now, if your objective is not that expensive type that we mentioned before with the built-in iris diaphragm, you wouldn't really be able to see very much at all on the screen, um, which means that inevitably you'd have to use the 40 times objective, which would only give you a magnification of 400 times on the screen, so far below uh, the, the minimum requirement of a thousand times. So, 
what, we, what we've done with our live blood analysis systems is to actually increase the, magnif the magnification to the screen four times. So this means that if you're using the, the uh, 40 times objective, um, the um, magnification through the eyepieces will be 400, but on the screen will be 1,600 times, um, which is really ideal for live blood analysis. Um, now, the other benefit of this is because of the uh, uh, because the 40 times objective that, that we use doesn't use any oil, uh, you're also then able to switch back to a, a smaller objective. And if you still need to scan around the sample a bit, um, and then you also still have the 100 times objective um, that you can then use if you need to really zoom into a particular cell or microorganism, which is something often used when looking for um, you know spirochetes and alpha-form bacteria and so on. Uh, using the, the 100 times objective will then give you an on-screen magnification of 4,000 times. Uh, which really is very unusual for, for microscopes. Um, but of course, it's, it's actually ideal for live blood analysis. So just to illustrate this, we have a, a few images here just of a specific area, a specific area of interest in the blood, um, in a live blood sample. Um, now this first image is with the standard on-screen magnification that you would get with most other microscope systems. This is about 400 times uh, magnification. Uh, also using a 20 watt microscope and uh, um, a 40 watt objective with an oil dark field condenser. Now, if we look at the monocyte here, the, the white blood cell at the center of the screen in there, uh, using our system with the additional on-screen magnification and the uh, stronger light source, you can actually see in the next example, to consider what that monocyte looked like in the previous image, uh, there's the monocyte there towards the left-hand side. Um, so you can actually see the, the difference very, very clearly. The, the monocyte is much larger, and we can actually now see all these other anomalies around the monocyte that, that weren't visible before. These little small bubbles in the background there that relate to fermentation. You know, seeing this in a case would would uh, indicate the need for, for a candidate type of protocol. Um, and if you didn't have a system to show you that, you wouldn't actually have, have picked that up at all. So then finally, if we, if we wanted to increase the magnification even more to the maximum level, uh, using the 100 times objective, uh, you would achieve a, a 4,000 times magnification on the screen. Uh, this is the type of image that you would be getting. So, um, you know, you really can see <laughs> the size of that monocyte there. <coughs> Wow, you can really see the difference that the additional magnification makes. So uh, being able to show clients a live video feed of their blood on a screen is really central to live blood analysis, isn't it? And this is, of course, achieved by attaching a camera to the microscope. Now, I've seen microscopes that have cameras attached to an eyepiece, but the recommended way is to have a separate camera tube in the microscope. Is that correct? Oh, yes, yes, definitely. You know, correct, connecting a, a camera to one of the eyepieces is, is, is really not the ideal way of doing it um, because you are really just sacrificing one of your eyepieces. Um, and because the camera then um, being used there, uh, it makes it, it nearly impossible to use the other eyepiece. Um, the best, as you said, is to have a dedicated camera tube in the head of the microscope. Now, the term that is used for these types of microscopes is trinocular, uh, whereas the microscopes that don't have a separate camera tube are called binocular. Okay, thank you. And the type of camera connected to the microscope is also quite important, isn't it? Is there as much variation in the types of cameras available for microscopes as well? Well, well, yes, there is. Um, you know, and again, we we see see a fairly wide price range here between the different types of cameras. Um, the first thing to look out for is. Uh, whether the camera has been built specifically for microscopy. Uh, now, this is important because it's not if it's not uh, specifically a microscope camera, uh, then you'll often end up having these spots on the screen that you just won't be able to get off. Um, now, these are min minute imperfections on the components in and in front of the camera sensor. And if they're there, uh, <laughs> there really is no way of getting rid of them. Uh, I've tested 
many cameras and um, some of them had you know so many spots on the screen that you're really not able to to see anything in the blood clearly at all uh, this really is is quite frustrating when you when you have to struggle with that um, and manufacturers and suppliers of these cameras are, are usually quite shocked when they see this uh, you know themselves because when the camera is used normally um, you know for the purpose that it was designed for you know with the lens attached in front of it um, you are not able to see any any type of spots but you know mounting it on the uh, on the microscope these actually become really very obvious we actually have an example here um, so I had to look through some of the the older images of some of the older cameras that we tested uh, to find an example of what these spots look like so this is an example of live blood just in, in Brightfield, and you can see some of these spots visible here. There's actually quite a large number of them. All the little arrows are pointing to the main ones, and there's still a few others in the background that the Amer uh, that we don't didn't have, have uh, arrows pointing to. So the, as you can see, there are really quite a few spots here, and um, I've actually also seen much worse, but you can imagine using a, a microscope a camera like this on, on your microscope it really is going to affect um, how how you you uh, will be able to use your your microscope um, and you know you you probably would get used to seeing the spots after a while and you probably would learn to ignore them um, but each and every client that you get will ask you what these spots are and uh, you know this can become quite frustrating um, now this image that we have next is with an HD camera that's specifically developed for microscopy and you can see the difference there not just in the in the absence of spots but also just the quality of the image and the, the color um, you know the appearance of the colors here all right so the next thing in terms of these cameras to look out for is, is not only the resolution most people are, are quite familiar with the resolution of cameras and what they should be looking for um, but also very important to look at the frame rate um, now the frame rate is how many frames the camera produces per second usually abbreviated as F FPS, which stands for frames per second now in digital cameras the higher the resolution the lower the frame rate usually is. Um, now there are digital ca cameras that have a, an extremely high resolution, 10 megapixels for example, um, but they then have a frame rate of five frames per second. Uh, and this means that the video then that you will see on the screen when you're looking through the, the blood sample will not be smooth at all. Uh, these cameras are actually better suited to applications where, um, where there isn't really really much movement of the of the object that you're viewing um, ideally a camera should have a frame rate of at least 25 frames per seconds um, which actually narrows down your options of, of high definition digital cameras quite quite dramatically okay and does dark field play a role in your choice of camera as well well yes yes it does um, but also, just the fact that we're viewing samples both in, in bright field and dark field, uh, the camera needs to be able to adjust its exposure levels properly between dark field and bright field. Um, this is not always achieved by the camera automatically, so often one would need to adjust these settings then in the camera's software. Um, and this then just becomes another factor to consider uh, because some cameras don't have the the most user-friendly software available and it, it becomes quite tedious to have to adjust these settings yes indeed and also not all of them are compatible with all operating systems are they absolutely this is also another another important factor you know this again this compatibility really does narrow down the list of options quite quite drastically um, because not all cameras are compatible with with both Windows and Mac um, and some cameras don't even support Windows 8. Wow so there are quite a number of factors to consider when choosing a microscope for live blood analysis and it seems that dark field plays a very important role here. Uh, you mentioned earlier that there are many anomalies that can only be seen in dark field and that these may be very important to the treatment of a case. Could you tell us a little bit more about this and which anomalies are only visible in dark field? Yes, yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, some people when they hear dark field immediately think of pleomorphism. 
and um, you know choose not to use a dark field system because they're not you know really using pleomorphism in the analysis um, but there are actually many other uh, very important anomalies um, that are not part of pleomorphism um, but that can only be seen in dark fields. Um, so the first one that comes to mind is fibrin, a very important finding, uh, which is of course related to liver stress. We see this in, in many live blood samples and uh, you know, often would, would be really important in terms of, of treatment and management of a case. Um, and fibrin would only really be, be visible in, in, um, in bright field if it's about a grade five out of five um, and you wouldn't really see the full extent of it in Brightfield. Uh, it, might, it might appear like a, a grade of two out of five in Brightfield when in fact it's a five out of five. So it really is very important to be able to see this clearly in dark field. Um, secondly, color microns. Um, now those are those small motile particles that move around actively in the plasma. Um, color microns are only really visible in dark field. Um, and then also most of your white cell anomalies are only really visible in dark field. So for example, when assessing the lobes within neutrophils, so when you're looking for things like neutrophil band cells, hypersegmented neutrophils, empty white blood cells, uh, looking at white blood cell viability, so whether the neutrophils actually move and whether their granules are moving, um, that's something that you're only really going to be able to see in dark field. And also very importantly, the white blood cells cell count. So the, the granulite, uh, granulocyte estimation that we mentioned in one of the uh, lessons where you um, get an estimation of the white blood cell count by looking through the eyepieces with a 20 times objective, um, that can only really be done in dark field because the white blood cells are quite bright and they, they're very obvious then when looking through the eyepieces in, in bright field that, that really is completely impossible. Um, now we're also able to see target cells much more clearly in dark field uh, and it's easier to distinguish between the various types of crystals in dark field um, and there are also certain microbes like the L-form bacteria um, that also can't be seen in bright field. And then uh, the last point probably to make here would be you know that even if you're not planning on using pleomorphism, uh, I still believe that this is very important um, just to be able to see the various pleomorphic growth forms um, because they tell us so much about the state of the terrain. Uh, I've seen many clients where the anomalies seen in, in, in live blood and bright field were not all that unusual um, but under uh, a high, n but then a high number of very advanced pleomorphic growth forms were seen in dark field, um, which then indicates that the treatment of the case needs to be more focused and specific to improving the terrain and, uh, and the progress in these cases will tend to be much slower uh, because of the length of time that the terrain has been compromised for. Uh, well, thank you very much for that, Dr. Rocker. Um, very interesting. Uh, we do have, thank you. yeah, we do have uh, quite a few questions here. Um, uh, please pop your questions in the box, and we will endeavour to answer them. Um, so, um, what about the general upkeep of microscopes? Can you tell us a little bit about how how much um, uh, maintenance they need? Well, they actually don't really require that much maintenance. You know, if you use them properly for their for their intended intended purpose, um, they don't really require much maintenance. The uh, lenses and the components are um, usually fixed in the microscope in a way that um, where they won't really move and and dust won't really get into the, the components of the microscope. You would need to you know, keep the stage clean, so free of dust and free of oil. Um, so you would need to, um, you know, at the end of the day, or perhaps before um, your analysis in the day, uh, make sure that the stage is clean and wipe off any oil with a, a, an alcohol swab. And usually we would find a little bit of dust collecting on the field iris uh, diaphragm. This is the the area at the in the base of the microscope where the light comes through from the light source. Um, so you'll see a little bit of dust collecting on there. Um, it doesn't really affect the um, what you're able to see unless it really becomes a very thick layer of dust. <laughs> 
but um, this is something that also should just be be wiped off with a, with a clean cloth from time to time. Um, we do supply the microscopes with dust covers, so at the end of the day, when you when you finished with the analysis, you can uh, place the dust cover over the microscope, and um, you know that will prevent dust from getting into into the onto the stage and so on. Okay, thank you. And how long do halogen bulbs last? Well, halogen bulbs usually would last, uh, depending on how, how frequently you use the microscope, we usually find people have to replace the halogen bulb at least once a year, sometimes twice a year. Um, and the, the halogen bulbs are not, not extremely expensive, um, but you know, it, they usually tend to, to go while you're busy with, with the client, uh, so you have to interrupt the session and then, um, you know, replace the light bulb. And in most cases, practitioners would have forgotten where they, where they left the spare, uh, so it, it causes a bit of panic. Um, so that's, that's also why most people tend to opt for the LED system. Okay, thank you. And um, could you please tell our attendees about the microscopes that we provide on the website, as well as the entry-level microscope that we make available for our attendees? Could you explain a little bit about all that, right, please? Right. Absolutely, absolutely. So we've we've put together a microscope specifically for uh, blood analysis, so that you're able to see everything that you should be able to see everything that you've learned about in the course uh, with your microscope system. It has all the required specifications to be able to look at, at blood samples in bright field and dark field. Um, all four of the models that are available. Um, will allow you to see everything that you should be able to see in the blood um, properly. Um, the differences between these four units um, really just boils down to the type of light source and the type of camera. So um, the first option that you can see there, the HD LED dark field microscope, um, has a the 9 watt LED light source and the high definition HDMI a USB camera. Um, and then there's different combinations. We have a standard definition LED microscope. We have a high definition 50 watt um, microscope, 50 watt halogen. And then we have a standard definition uh, camera with a 50 watt halogen light source as well. Um, so those are the, the four units that are available. You can see the prices there in, in US dollars. And um, we do have a, an entry level type of system that we've also put together um, that basically we've, we've designed the entry level for practitioners that, that um, are not able to afford the, um, the microscopes with all the, the specifications. So we've taken off some of the really non-essential features um, and to provide the microscope that still allows you to see everything that you should be able to see in dark field and to use blood analysis properly without uh, sacrificing any any of the um, you know quality on the microscope. So the entry level system, instead of having five objectives, only has three objectives. It has a four times objective, a ten times objective, and a forty times objective. Um, so it's not supplied with the 20 times objective and the 100 times objective. As I mentioned earlier, that 100 times objective is quite costly. Um, so that, that does affect the, the price if we don't include it in the system that allows us to, to, to reduce the price quite dramatically. Um, and the 100 times objective, because of the additional magnification that we have on the screen, um, is not something that we use that, that often. Most of the analysis is actually done with the 40 times objective. Um, and the 20 times objective is, is also not as critical as the others. There, there, are, um, there are spaces available in the nose piece of the entry-level microscope that, that will allow you to, to upgrade and add those objectives at a later stage. Um, so that option is available. And the other difference with the entry-level is um, that it has a standard definition camera and it has a 7 watt LED light source instead of the 9 watt LED, so not quite as bright as the top of the range LED system, um, but still bright enough, um, even you know brighter than the 50 watt, to allow you to see everything that you should be able to see in dark field. Uh, the entry level goes for uh, just under under $4,000. It's 3775, uh, so significantly 
cheaper than the than the other units. Um, thank you. And where are the microscopes made? Well, that's that's a very good question because we did mention the quality of some of the microscopes from China. Um, our microscopes are actually manufactured in Japan, uh, so we have a, a microscope manufacturer there, a factory that, that uh, manufactures a, a wide range of microscopes, but they manufacture uh, the microscopes for us for blood analysis uh, under contract. Uh, according to our own specifications. So that's why we're able to provide these features that are not really available in, in other types of microscopes. Um, now the microscope um, optics that are used in these microscopes are based on Nikon optics. So in terms of quality, uh, it really is, is really very good. And how does your brand compare to Olympus, for example? Well, yeah, that's an interesting one because we've often had people that, you know, did another another type of course in, in blood analysis, perhaps a, one where, where phase contrast and bright field is, is taught, um, and they they ended up purchasing a, a, a an Olympus microscope. Uh, and some of the common bra uh, models that are used uh, then would be the CX, the CX41 is quite a well-known one. Um, and when you look at the specifications, uh, the problem is that the light source again in these microscopes um, usually it's a 30 watt LED, uh, a 30 watt halogen light source. So again, when you actually try to do dark field with these Olympus microscopes, you you're not really able to to see everything that you should be able to see. So for an Olympus microscope, the type of Olympus microscope that will allow you to see uh, all the anomalies properly in dark field, it would have to have a, a hundred watt. A halogen light source or a 100 watt cold light source, fiber optic light source. And when you then look at all the other specifications that uh, are provided in, in our microscopes, the five types of objectives, um, the, the 100 times objective with the uh, um, built in iris diaphragm and all those, if you compare those spec for spec, um, you actually will find that the Olympus is, is a lot more expensive. Uh, in terms of the CX41, the, the 30 watt um, Olympus microscope system, um, it, the, the cost price is around the same as our nine watt uh, LED systems. Um, but then you have a microscope system with a very well-known, reputable brand, um, but you're not really going to be able to use it for uh, dark field analysis. Thank you. And um, are you still offering free shipping on your microscopes? Yes, yes, absolutely. Free shipping is still included. We um, ship with DHL, um, so it's really quite fast and, and quite uh, reliable uh, and it's completely you can track the progress during the the whole process as well and um, what is the warranty on your microscopes well rent warranty we actually provide a two-year warranty on the system mm. um, industry standard is usually one year but we're able to do two years just because of the build quality of the microscopes they um, really quite quite reliable and and uh, resilient so there's not really much that can go wrong in these systems, but in the event if something does happen, um, the warranty covers any any type of, of uh, issues. And usually, um, if there's a faulty part, we would ship a replacement part um, directly to you with DHL as well. Thank you. And what are the most important differences uh, regarding cameras and um, uh, halogen and LED? Uh, lighting. What are the most important differences regarding them? Yeah, I think with 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 regards to the models that we do have available, um, the types of cameras uh, there's actually quite a substantial difference between the types of cameras. The standard definition camera is a, is a you know USB type of camera um, that connects to the computer. It's also compatible with Windows and Mac, um, and the definition is not 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 poor, it's not that you'd have a terribly pixelated image, um, it, it works quite well, um, but the, the HD camera um, that we use now that's standard with our uh, HD LED system is actually a, an HDMI USB camera. Um, this is the latest actually 
directly in in microscopy cameras um, it connects via USB directly to the computer um, and provides a very good high quality high definition image image um, and everything is adjusted automatically within the camera between bright field and dark field so there's no need to adjust settings or exposure values or anything like that um, and then it has a separate output via HDMI that connects directly to a, an external monitor now the benefit with that which is quite quite nice is that as the practitioner if you're sitting with your client across the desk from you um, you're able to view their blood sample on your computer on your computer screen but then you have the option to have a, a separate monitor facing the client um, that's uh, connected to the camera via HDMI where they actually have a full screen view uh, of their blood, uh, which is really quite nice. The, the other way that it's usually done then if you have to have, connect a, a separate monitor without the HDMI option is then to connect that monitor directly to your computer uh, but then you end up having a, a screen where there's still menus visible on the on the other monitors, so not not really ideal. Okay, thank you. And uh, one final question: If you do have any more questions, please put them in the box. Um, if I buy a microscope now, is it likely to go out of date um, soon? Well, you know, microscopes haven't, haven't really changed that, that dramatically. Um, you know, the lenses and the components and so on have all um, remained fairly similar to what they used to be. The main, the main changes have been with the type of, of light source. So the LED, uh, which is something I also didn't mention earlier, the difference between LED and, and halogen. Halogen is the, the um, sort of standard that was always used for, for microscopes. Um, it produces a type of very similar to a pure white light uh, with halogen, but it does create a lot of heat. So a 50 watt halogen system, uh, which is the minimum type of hal halogen light needed for dark field, would really create quite a lot of, of heat. Um, so those components are then the, the actual light bulb is then housed outside of the microscope, usually at the back of the microscope in a separate box, and the light is then um, then diverted into the microscope. Uh, this is often referred to as cooler illumination, if, you, if you've seen that term anywhere. Um, but LED has been the, the latest uh, development in, in microscopes, and there's a big move uh, where microscopes are now uh, featuring more and more LED illumination. Uh, previously, it wasn't really used because LED, it wasn't really possible to dim LED properly, um, but nowadays we're able to actually dim LED so we're able to reduce the brightness and um, the benefit with LED of course is that it has a very long lifespan you know up to 25 years um, you know there's no need to change a light bulb but it, it works it, it keeps its level of brightness um, it doesn't change it stays completely white um, so so that is that is actually the latest feature and the 9 watt LED that we have in our microscopes is actually a few years ahead of, of what is available in, uh, uh, from other manufacturers at the moment. So that's unlikely to really change. Um, cameras might change in the future. Um, that's something that is constantly being developed and ov obviously operating systems also change. Um, but you know that's, that's just an attachment. That's something that can be replaced and upgraded, upgraded at a later stage. But the microscope itself, you know, is not something that, you, that you're that likely to have to replace any, um, you know, upgrade any components as it, as it stands at the moment. Thank you. And is it possible to update the entry-level microscope to the level of the more expensive ones? To, to a certain extent, you would be able to. You are, of course, able to add those two additional objectives, the 20 times and, and 100 times objective. You're able to add them, uh, and the, the process is fairly simple. It's really just a matter of screwing those objectives into place, into the, the nose piece. Um, so that's something that can be done. Um, you are able to upgrade the camera to a, a HD, a HDMI USB camera. Um, that, that will also make quite a big difference. And um, the only difference would be then the strength of the of the LED light. Um, it is possible to to replace and upgrade the the base of the microscope, the foot of the microscope. But then it it will become uh, you know then it will become costly. It it would probably cost you a little more then in total 
than the um, than the, the the top of the range microscope would cost you. Um, but then you obviously have the, the option to to uh, upgrade it as you go along. Okay, thank you. Um, any more questions? Please put them in the box there. Um, so thank you very much for that. Very interesting. And um, uh, please let us know if you would like more information on any of the microscopes that we've mentioned today. Um, and also on the entry level microscope. We'll be uh, very happy to help and advise. Um, so anything to add to that, Dr. Rocker? Well, um, you know, something that, that we are able to do because of, of um, you know, the, the availability of things like Skype nowadays, if, if, um, um, if there's a, a need to actually see what live samples look like under a microscope, um, if an attendee would like to see, we can always arrange a Skype session and, you know, there's the option to share the screen so I can actually show them um, live from the actual microscope uh, what the samples would look like. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. And um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and thank you very much, Dr. Rocker. Thank you and goodbye. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.